What's up, YouTube? Welcome back to the Discourse Syndicate channel. Today, what we're going to talk about is I want to I want to discuss the history that bankers have of extracting value out of currencies and monies and how that applies to crypto, because I think there's a big conversation being missed here. And so shout out to K4K Crypto. I was listening to a stream of his the other day and he had just dropped a small mention of this, but like the history of trade beads and they go all the way back to Africa, right, which is essentially uh, one of the earliest forms of currency that they had was these trade beads. And because the, the beads were really, really hard to make in Africa and they had high perceived value because people wanted them. So they would use these as a form of currency. Europeans came over, the, the party was eventually destroyed because Europeans came over, saw that they were using this as currency. And you see the ease of production of these beads using methods employed by European artisans enabled exploitation via speculative attack. It sounds like a 51% attack like we've heard on Bitcoin, right? And other, um, other uh, cryptocurrencies, yeah? And so what eventually happened was the Europeans made a bunch of these, dumped them out of the market and destroyed the market. But in the meantime, they were still able to trade all of this for the ivory, the gold and the other physical items that they wanted to get in exchange for the beads. So what did they do there? This is this is probably one of the earliest examples we've got of exploiting and extracting value out of a system and then just leaving it for utter ruins, right? So everyone else got destroyed out of this and then they profited the most. Okay, let's pivot a little bit. Let's talk about currencies. Well, if we talk about currencies right now, we're literally witnessing the same thing happening in the United States dollar. And I'm gonna give you some history on currencies and all that, just give me a sec. So. If we look, like the um, things changed when quantitative easing came out. So let me give you a little history. Okay, the great uh, financial crisis, which is GFC for short, of which we all know it as being 2009. It actually started in 2006. So the sub uh, prime mortgage crisis and all of these um, restacking of uh, CDOs and basic toxic, basically toxic debt being resold and repackaged over and over and over again, right? It started back then. But it didn't actually come out and come to a head and create the devastation and the recession within the economy until 2008, 2009. Yeah. So at that point, one of the solutions that they came up with, the Fed and the, the policymakers, right, in their little backroom meetings with Warren Buffett and others who got sweetheart deals, by the way, by helping to advise, I put that in quotations, on what the solutions and what the what they should do in response. OK, one of those responses was something called QE, quantitative easing. That means you go out and you ease the, the picture, you ease the monetary, the monetary um, action by printing more money. So essentially, it's just going to inflate the currency, yeah? And what's funny is that, you know, these things are often shamed upon in cryptocurrencies. Uh, US dollar tither is constantly being, you know, berated and, and, and battered about the fact that they're constantly printing more and more supply. But the United States dollar has been doing it since 2009. So once quantitative easing started, the first QE cycle started, that sent us on this trajectory. And you see the next huge, like this is literally almost a vertical line on this chart, which is why I'm referencing this. This last huge um, injection in QE, which has been essentially nonstop since 2009, just printing, 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 printing. How many trillions of dollars are in circulation? Nobody even knows. But the last one was from the, the, uh, the COVID reaction. Okay, so this currency, is hyperinflating. This currency is on a parabolic growth curve up now. That is not good because that is the amount that's in circulation. So the more that's in circulation, it creates hyperinflation, meaning that value purchasing power is being stripped out of that system. But because the banks get it first, right? And whoever's closest to inflation is the is the beneficiary, the primary beneficiary, right? Because all of the COVID money was rolled out, the PPP, the EIDL, et cetera, was rolled out to who first? You directly in your bank account or the bank first? And then the bank issued it to you. Aha. Okay. So you see they're benefiting. So they're once again, extracting all that value out of the fiat. So what's going to be left is nothing. It's a, it's going to be a shell that's left. But what they'll have, and, and I could pull up all kinds of pieces on this, right? We could go into BlackRock and Vanguard and all of these big, you know, trillion dollar hedge funds that have gone out and bought physical land. They own suburb communities. Middle class America is owned by BlackRock now. I could go out and give countless examples of how they've gone out now and taken this, this worthless dollar 
and extracted maximum value by going and getting shares in companies, assets, land, right? Real assets. We've talked about this in the past. The amount of people that are holding real assets versus speculative assets in retail is at its lowest point ever. Where if you look, that's the exact opposite of what a fund manager will do. A fund manager will go and their job is to own actual real assets defined by the Fed. Real assets, land, you know, uh, boats, uh, you know, things like that, right? Real physical stuff. Commodities even are in there. Okay, so let's let's take a little quick blast to the past here. I've talked about this before that the average fiat currency only lasts 27 years. We talked about a lot of currency history before. I think it was on one of the, uh, I think it was on the very first macro show that we did. Okay, but did you know that there's been at least 775 fiat currencies that were created since the 11th century? The 11th century is uh, when the very first one was founded in China. Today, there's less than 200. I think uh, the number I gave before was about 185. So again, these numbers are are not uh, not exact numbers because I think it's really hard to track this stuff down. Okay, uh, next is the longest lasting, uh, let's call it currency, is actually gold. Gold has been used as a currency for thousands of years since at least 700 BC. Okay, so the oldest fiat currency in existence right now is this guy right here, the pound sterling. Okay, uh, and that's that's been around for 300 years, even though it's changed. Okay, beginning in 1694 with the founding of the Bank of England. And if you look at the United States dollar and, and what that's kind of the, the change that that's gone through is it started off as a, uh, a dollar or a currency, uh, a fiat rather, that was backed by a real commodity or currency, which was gold. Up until the gold standard, the Bretton Woods gold standard was dropped in 1972. From there, we turned into a petrodollar, right? A petro backed dollar. And then as shortly after that, like early 90s, without them even publicly announcing this, we kind of just turned into a debt backed dollar. And so now the the um, the U.S. dollar is just a promise of a promise because they're based on treasury notes and promissory notes backed by the Federal Reserve and the Treasury of the United States. So we're just recycling promises at that po at this point, and there's no real backing. It's backed by debt, right? So we've we've created this um, this really really uh, destructive uh, piece of value and. I don't think a lot of people in the United States are understanding that they're still trusting in this dollar when they should start to become really, really eerie of this. And they should start to become um, on the defense with this, especially after the last two years. 40% of the circulating supply has been printed over the last 18 months of the United States dollar. That has never happened in history. So there's going to become a point where the value's been, maximum value has been extracted from taxpayers and you're left with worthless paper. So this, this as a whole, by the way, is the argument for cryptocurrency. This is why the banks are against cryptocurrencies. This is why even today, right now, there's probably a story out there of a Chase Bank account, a Bank of America bank account being shut down because of a Coinbase transaction. Because even though publicly they're saying, yeah, yeah, you know, we're starting to support this stuff. We're hiring people out and, you know, we support it, blah, blah, blah. They're still shutting down accounts because it is a competitor to them. Now, Let's take the Bitcoin piece for just a second and we'll wrap up is Bitcoin itself has gone through this. I think in the early days they wanted to try and test this and, and that's where these hacks came from. All the different exploits on, on Bitcoin. And then they just realized, oh, well, just like gold and silver, which JP Morgan has a chokehold on, is we can we can own this and control it. And it might be done the same way that they've managed to kind of hold down and suppress gold and silver, which is through... Um, ETFs and, and paper trading over the top of holding physical assets, the physical gold and silver. They might do it just like that. I don't know. Or there might be some sort of other bigger strategy that they're using. But the fact is, is that JP Morgan got caught and they ended up paying like over $900 million for commodities trading, spoofing, um, essentially manipulation, lying for over a decade. And that's just what they had to pay. And that's just the time frame that they pulled up and one guy was found guilty. Of course, the trader himself on the, on the trade floor is who got in trouble, not JP Morgan. They just had to pay the fine. But how many, how many billions of dollars did they make over a decade of spoofing and suppressing and manipulating the price of gold and silver? Okay, so if we roll out a ETF, enough ETFs on Bitcoin, why couldn't they just do the same thing? Understand? 
So this is really what you're up against. It's like, that's why gold and silver have lasted is because now they have full control over it. So similar things could happen with Bitcoin. They have full control over it because this is the game that they play. So anyways, layers of this. So big takeaways is understand what you're, what you're using and transacting with, right? Now more than ever is that US dollar in your pocket isn't really worth the same that it was. And understand that there, this is a game of hot potato and whoever's left holding it at the end is the one who's going to lose the most. And while all these people are extracting out maximal value, most people are over here not doing that and thinking that that is the value in the United States dollar. They're in for a rude awakening, big wake up call. So anyways, that's what I wanted to share with you today. If you like this sort of thing or you got something to add to the conversation, comment below, uh, like this video so it gets in front of more people or share it with a friend. And of course, take a second, subscribe, hit the bell notification, and we'll see you again real soon in another video.